running the next section of our panels, which is a Q&A with Andy Ball. That's him. Please welcome Andy Ball to the room. Hey, Gary. Uh, he was born on September the 5th, 1984, and he shares a birthday with Freddie Mercury. He's got a total of three rec or two records out, two EPs, and two ringtones on iTunes, should you want to download them. Uh, and he's been making music for an awfully long time. Uh, we have a, a lot to get through with Andy. There's a great story here. Uh, primarily, we'll just be talking uh, mostly about his most recent record, Sea of Approval. But in order to get there, I think you're going to discuss the process that he went through because you've gone through a lot, Andy. You've done a lot of things. Yeah, some of it's more compelling than other. Oh, by the way, I'm, you can hear I'm a little underwear, so I'm sorry I have to listen to me snort and sniffle through this, but we'll just get through it together, all right, gang? Can we just get some more levels on Andy's mic? Um, all right, well, let's talk about the early days when you were a young singer-songwriter and keyboard player. Uh, you grew up, interestingly, kind of half the time in Saudi Arabia and half the time in Australia. Can you talk me through that period and kind of how it influenced you? Uh, well, my, my uh, parents had moved to the Middle East to work in a hospital there. And I, I, my brothers were raised there and I was born there, but I left quite young. So I actually came to Australia quite young. So I don't really... Um, I don't really remember too much of the Middle East, but I obviously remember growing up in the suburbs uh, of Sydney. So I grew up about an hour north of here. Um, you want me to reminisce on that generally? I just wanted you to talk about, I know that your brother's a musician as well, and you know there were a lot of keyboards and other instruments in the house. Yeah, so I get, my dad was a doctor, um, but um, he played piano to kind of let off steam. So in... in uh, they had spent time in the, the States and then, you know, in, and then in uh, the Middle East. And uh, it was mainly the, um, the doctors that were working there had all been shipped over from the States through, I think it was a hospital in like Nashville or something like that. So they all kind of played country music and that sort of thing. So my dad played a little bit of stride piano and we had a piano in the house and a harpsichord and a, and a harmonium. So there were those sorts of things around the house. Lots of keys, basically. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I'm trying to think that when the, the kind of moment, that stuff was around and my parents made me get sort of lessons, but I, I hated it. I mean, who, when you're seven years old, it, it's, you don't really want to be playing scales and things like that. You don't no, you absolutely don't. No, it's, and it seems like terminally boring and you don't understand don't, don't worry. where any of this leads to. Right? So you're doing these scales and you think... It, the, the purpose is to be bored. That's it. <laughs> and just to like, it's like homework. And that, I reckon that kind of way of thinking, it sort of stays with you in various ways throughout your life and you have to undo it. Were you listening to music at the time? Is your dad giving you music to listen to? Or? So I guess a pivotal moment in the listening thing was my dad went back to the Middle East when I was in the third grade. He went back for a few months. Uh, they needed some sort of help or something, but he came back with a bag full of pirated cassette tapes. And um, he walked in, having come from the airport, and he dumped this bag, this like Hessian bag of cassette tapes on the floor. And uh, I don't know if my sister was, oh, my sister was born then, so she was crawling around, and I had two older brothers, and we all just kind of launched at this pile of cassette tapes and grabbed what we could. And I, I just, I didn't know, I mean, I didn't know what any of it really was, but I just went for the Pink Floyd cassettes because they had the nice artwork. So I grabbed those and I had a little, uh, like a knockoff kind of walk, Walkman thing. And I started listening to Pink Floyd The Wall, which is when you're seven years old. Pretty heavy for a seven year old. It's like, I don't know if any of you, so Pink Floyd's kind of a running joke, but it's also totally awesome as well because it's, it's like, um, a lot of what probably everyone in this room does now is electronic music or music that you make in your bedroom. And it's real DIY. It's kind of come from a world that happened after punk where it's like more about you just making something fun and doing whatever you can with whatever you have. And Pink Floyd is like this dinosaur, like Led Zeppelin from another time when there was like tons of money and tons of drugs and just studio time and millions of heaps of, of hoop, like hubris is how, you know, all of this stuff is really badly out of fashion now. And, and you know, there's, there's kind of pros and cons to that. But um, it's really dramatic, melodramatic, highly laid music. 
And at its best, it's really imaginative. And when you're seven and you plug your ears into this little Sony Walkman and put on Pink Floyd The Wall, and you're sucked into this like parallel dimension that somehow a story about fascism and drugs and rock and roll, and and it it's kind of totally ridiculous and overblown, but it's done with such conviction that there's a bit of goodness and truth in there as well, and it's really imaginative and totally immersive. So I listened to that tape until the it was no longer magnetic and, you know, the top end was gone from it. And I know I still know every single note, note for note, that solo and word. And you don't second guess it when you first start listening because it's just awesome. Like, think back to how many of the first influences you have that are, you're maybe kind of embarrassed to admit now, but when you, when you listen to it at the time, you never heard anything like it and it blew your tiny brain part. Totally. What, what else was in that bag? Uh, there was probably some Led Zeppelin as well. There was Marvin Gaye, uh, which is an endure, actually an enduring love. Of well, I was going to say, I don't know whether, how many people are acquainted with Andy's music, but you know, a good pro proportion of it is soul music, and his training was kind of initially soul. You would expect him to have a bag full of Curtis Mayfield, Marvin Gaye, Otis Redding. A lot of that talk. stuff came when I was a teenager, when I was at high school, and the stuff that was happening at the time was like um, corn and Limp Biscuit and Eminem. That's not at all what I would have expected. So rap rock, which I didn't like. Uh, so, so I, yeah. No judgments, of course, but I, it wasn't, it didn't ring my bell in any way. So I've, I kind of started finding some other stuff based on what was lying around the house. And, and kind, of, kind of classic 70s soul stuff seemed to really ring my bell because it had a different set of rules. Like keyboards existed, orchestras existed, men who sang kind of high and soulfully. It's very different to what everything that was in pop music at the time. And kind of what you ended up doing for that first record, definitely, you know, it's quite reminiscent of, of We're Too Young, uh, which was Annie's first album. And in the lead up to that record, I know that you were going through the process of, you know, a lot of people had noticed Andy because uh, his brother was a successful DJ called Deep Child, who's still DJing a lot here and overseas. Um, and Andy sang on one of, one of the songs that Deep Child put out, and it was a beautiful vocal, really high kind of vocal. A lot of people thought it was a girl at the time and it's like that still dogs you at times. It doesn't dog me, I love it. Okay, great. And, uh, and then uh, off the back of that, a lot of people were interested and Andy kind of got management and um, some label interest quite young. And you were taken overseas actually to showcase in the States for huge people like LA, Antonio L.A. Reid uh, and Def Jam Records, which is a lot of pressure for a 19 year old. Can we talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, wow, now see this, this was maybe 10 years ago, I just left high school and everything you said is right, I got a manager who had been working with my brother at the time and uh, I started doing some demos and um, I don't know, for some reason we felt like we, should, we would try to get interest overseas in the United States. It sounds so dumb now because I don't have any, it's like, you, you have this kind of ambition of like, I want to be a worldwide artist or something like that and so you start looking elsewhere when you should really just look where you are like wherever you are is the starting point so that was a terminal terminal floor of the way i was thinking was i was never looking at where i was going like who, who do i have here what am i doing where can i play now is it reasonable to say that that's partially a response to the fact that if at the time the soul scene in australia it wasn't immediately apparent where you would work here necessarily if you, you were that kind I think of. That's true. It was that was everything was real post strokes kind of dance rock. Talking about two thousand two, maybe. That's right. Yeah. So that was very much the world. So I felt odd, right? Um, I felt like the odd one out, and it's good to feel like the odd one out if you can learn to not be phased by that and just actually be kind of happy and confident about that. But when you flick like a rubber band in the opposite direction trying to show how, like, if you, if you think you need to take big steps to justify your oddness, you end up doing dumb things, right? Is that what you did? 
Well, I think I start, it, to think about going overseas just seemed compl- like I wasn't ready for that at all. And how was the experience of meeting with people like L.A. Reid, who's like, you know, Russell Simmons level crazy music business person? That was, I mean, that was nerve wracking because I went over, I was 19, I went over with my manager at the time. And um, we got put up in this really ritzy hotel in New York. And you go in and you do the showcase. And L.A. Reid is like not a big guy, but he is the biggest small man I'd ever met. So like a, a, an intense character. You could feel his power just emanating from him and the kind of hushed awe that this entourage followed him around as he walked into the room. And he'd sit down and he'd talk for 30 seconds and he'd play and slaps his thigh and nods his head and goes, okay, great. And then leaves. Now, he's one of his vice presidents of the label, a and guys, have been really keen on signing us. He'd, he'd, got, he'd been the one who'd flown us over. And so you're getting all this hype and you walk into the office and there's platinum discs and everyone's like really, you know, loud, confident, New York kind of vibe. And I'm like, I oh, shouldn't, I shouldn't be here at all. Like I'm 18 years old, I'm from Sydney, from the suburbs. Like, I don't know, I didn't really, I wasn't ready for that sort of thing. I wasn't, I didn't believe myself at all. But I went in there and I gave it hell. And then, um, you know, we went and had dinner and all that sort of thing. And then just never heard back from it. We flew us back to Sydney and there was like no word. And eventually you got word from the vice president saying, the guy who'd wanted to sign, saying, I think LA just didn't want to sign an Australian kid. It seemed like too much work. No one was going to buy it. And I was like, that's a nice excuse. But really, I know it just, it sucked. Like it was just not good. That's brutal, but I mean, you can't really tell. It probably was quite, I mean, you, that may have been true. Maybe it just wasn't the right time. But either way, that's a huge thing to have happen around 19, kind of 20, 21. Yeah, but whatever. You know, you, you, you like have that experience and then it, you, and it seems like such a big deal at the time. Look, I've been rejected. Didn't they see my star quality shining through? And then you realise it's like, who gives a shit? Like, you get knocked back. Like, it's mo- you get knocked back all the time, right? And you really shouldn't be bitter about that. Like, Absolutely. It's, not a, it's actually not a bad thing. Like, thank God you get knocked back all the time. Because if I'm thinking, I remember thinking, thinking back to that experience, going, man, if I put out that record, and, like, that would have been so awful, the whole experience. And, anyway, you shouldn't see all your knockbacks and failures as, like, any kind of reflection on you. It's... I don't know how to explain it, but... We will like, explain it as we go, because okay. it's a key point of the whole thing. With you. Um, and then straight after that, you were straight back into writing, and uh, interestingly, I remember you telling me that you were doing some tracking in the studio, and then someone called and said, hey, I have to get in and use the studio, can I... Oh, this is the Kanye West story? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Kanye West calls the studio, and he's in there doing a day of tracking and stuff, and then Kanye West people were like, can you get... Andy out of the studio because Kanye has to record in that studio. And then he's like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I don't mind. And so... Well, the story is, this is just a nice little diversion. Nothing really comes of this. But Kanye came into the studio and recorded his vocal, his vocal on some It was an intro to a... F- you guys won't remember. There was a rapper called Fabulous who was fif- uh, famous for about 15 minutes. Right. And he had to do... He produced a track for Fabulous and had to do an intro to this Fabulous track. And I... He, Fabulous, I, I was spelt a certain way, and it was he had to spell it out in the intro, like F A B O L O. No, stop it. What is it? How do I? How does it spell? And so after a few takes, it took him thirty minutes to do um to do oh, this wow. one line. Yeah, but then I was like, can't you? I'm I'm actually an artist myself. I'm in here. This is actually my studio session. I'm in here recording. Can I play some stuff? And he was like, okay. He seemed like he was. He, I mean, at the time, I remember you telling me that he was actually really nice and no, he was really nice. I would have been like. Ah oh, shit, do I have to listen to you? Yeah. <laughs> like, but he was really nice and he listened to stuff and he pointed out some things that were useful, like, you know, the importance of having hooks and structure and, and sort of shared his, uh, you know, his approach to music, which was um, to, to, you know, have, have an expression of his vision. But then it, the, the music that makes the, the, the album in the end is the one that he feels... Um, he has consensus on from his his friends, where he says from like his you know his friends from this sort of social circle and this social circle, and um, I guess that's been the key to his success because if that's that 
uh, if you extrapolate that, that's become his career. It's been Kanye, but on a globally successful level that that you can get into whether you're um, American or Australian or English or you know, anywhere in the world. You know? Well, let's talk about Andy Ball's success and the various guises of it. Around that point, you were kind of producing uh, music for what became your debut, We're Too Young, and that was about 2007, 2008. Is that correct? I think so, yeah. Yeah, and uh, at that point, it was kind of... You were the artist, right? You were writing the tunes on piano. Yeah, that's right. And you'd kind of get your band together at some point and decide to rehearse them. And then after having written them, and they were kind of reminiscent of like Marvin Gaye's 70s soul orchestration, a little bit of Elton John maybe in there, some of that kind of 70s vibe. Uh, and then you'd take them into studio and Tony Buchan, who was a producer at the time, would, would produce the arrangements. You'd record it largely live and then put it out. And it was coming out through Island, which is a fairly commercially minded record label who would like to lodge singles. Uh, were you listening to Triple J? Were you a Triple J fan at the time? Or where did you imagine your music getting played? This is a really good question because it points out to me on reflection that I had no real vision. I didn't... I Sorry. Didn't... <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Do you know what I mean? Back, hold up. Back it up. No, no, this is, this is, this is a really... This is a, a kind of a useful um, maybe thing to talk about because I had no connection to the Australian music scene. I had no vision. I didn't know where to play. But you were playing... I mean, everybody... That's the thing. It's like you say that, but... Yeah, if, but you, if you were around then watching as an audience, you were, everyone was talking about this guy. Like, they were all like, oh my God, have you heard him sing? He's unbelievable, unbelievable keyboard player. Like, there was just a lot of talk and everyone was really excited to see what you were going to do. So it's funny to think that you had no connection to actually... The I had no singing. connection. I had no understanding. It was a foreign thing. I had a membrane of like management and label that separated me from everything I did. Right. So this is like... Um, this is a problem, especially if you're young and you're w trying to get into an industry that's essentially a community made up of individuals that you will see a lot. Uh, and that is how things get done. Going out to shows, meeting people, hanging out. Exactly. With them. Even on the level of just finding musicians to play with. All of that stuff was sort of done for me at the time. Because right. I thought, had this idea that all I had to do was write songs. And what were you writing about right now? I remember some of those songs being kind of like Small Town Girl was the first single, which was sort of a conversation with someone about the various misconceptions they might have about life and the fact Again, that they're Again, see, this is, true. lyrically, it's like, it was just whatever I could put together that rhymed. Like, and then trying to... And then wow, trying to... sugarcoat it, just like... I no, sometimes that. there's there's a hint of meaning in there, right? Always. So you've got, you've got this little flame of interest and meaning that you feel somewhere inside there. Um, but it takes time for that little flame to become like a furnace that you, you are actually uh, able to have experiences and integrate them and then then have them come out in, uh, like musically. When, you're, when I was at that age, I had certainly the little flame, but it, not the experience. So you have this little flame of some bit of pathos and then you string together the words and make it kind of a pop song. So on the surface of things, it's... It might even sound and look really meaningful to other people. And of course, there is a level of meaning to it, but I don't play those songs anymore, you know? Uh, and maybe one day I'll come back to them and I'll be able to reassess them and go, oh, you know what? There was a beautiful snapshot of being 19 years old there, but I don't play the songs anymore. I don't well, let's them. talk about that a bit because, you know, you, you did that record and that's, for, for the audience, it's probably the most set up record you could hope to go through making. You know, it's like, it's all there and you just have to service a single and put it out and hopefully it'll go on the radio and that'll be, and then you'll get to tour and it'll be good, right? But that's not what happened, right? Y you know, the, it was a more difficult process that you, than you'd previously imagined with that album. You went to service Small Town Girl, it got played a little on, it was a great song, and this is no... That's uh, a terrible song, please. I wish, I honestly actually, wish we weren't even talking about this record because I, know, I hate it gotta, so much. You've got to talk about the weird stuff. To yeah, no, it's true. This is, this, this is the shameful bit that's worth talking Everyone about. Everyone has the awkward teenage years. Yeah, you've yeah. You've got to yeah. be realistic about it because if you don't think that they do, then it, when you're having them, you'll think, oh, there's something wrong with me, when actually there's something right with you. This is key. In fact, if anything you can get out of this, it's just um, the legitimacy of your own story, really. Like, <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, I, <laughs> I, um, I feel like we should discuss like how that came out 
and then it sort of didn't get on the radio like you imagined it would. Here's a very, this is a, I'm going to try to sum this up as compellingly as possible. I did the record, it, you know, it took a lot of effort. I did, you know, I tried to make it the best it could. In the end, I overthought it. I took off the good songs and put the bad ones on. I had uh, so much pressure around this because I was at the time 22 and I had been working on putting out the record for years, right? So there was all this kind of karmic constipation as I waited to sort of like unblock again. And, uh, <laughs> and well, just go with me here. Come with me on this journey. Just go with him on this shit head of all. So we, we finished the, the, the album and um, suddenly it was recorded very well. It sound, if you took out my voice and just listened to the music, I think on that level, it's wonderful. Like that's the one thing I could say is that the, that little flame is the melody and the ear for sounds and structure. It's when you start trying to write words and you've only got the little, you know what I'm saying? So the music itself, I, I think is, um, it's, it's pretty and it was mixed really well and all this sort of thing. And if it were just an instrumental album, I think I'd be happy to have it exist. Um, it's only the fact that I was involved in it that makes me so deeply ashamed. <laughs> but anyway, I had a single that was a really good, I guess, kind of opening single. And I did a showcase, uh, the, the, the label, the major label showcase thing. Uh, and it, they were showcasing, we played a bunch of songs for some radio people. And Nova, at the time, had just started up and was like kind of doing some Australian music. And they picked up this song and they played it like six times a day for about three weeks. Very good. Yeah, and so my MySpace page was just blowing up. <laughs> um, and then, I don't know what happened, I'm not exactly certain, but they stopped playing it and they've never played anything else I ever did ever again. So it looked like there was going to be this kind of commercial career, this sort of... Um, singer songwriter, but in this kind of new commercial realm, in a kind of Sony sort of way, right? Like in a in a legitimate, but but still in the pop world on commercial radio, do it like you do it supporting Joss Stone. There was all of that. That's stuff. right. Yeah, I think that's the kind of the world people saw it going into. Yeah, that's right. I did the Joss Stone stuff, um, and then it just sort of di disappeared. And I toured on it. I toured the record, and it was like very bad numbers and I'd gone out with a full band with a horn section. I really wanted Hosting to a lot. Yeah, I really wanted to be like a you know, the full experience. I'm like, this has gotta be we're gonna do this. We've just gotta give it everything. Which is idealistic and I think again not relevant in our age now, which is like actually you give it everything with, with what you have, like and that's that's the spirit of the thing, rather than like a horn section or all this kind of stuff. It doesn't really matter. So we did all these shows it was really expensive. I lost it, like money, ton of money. And you know, the record company doesn't pay for that stuff. You pay for that. I was working as a personal trainer and a dishwasher at the time. So it took me a long time to pay that back. And it was kind of like a wound. That was a, that was a real big wound at the time. And then I, I um, that was it. That record was done. It was kind of it just flunked. And uh, and no one else touched it, obviously, because it was. I think it was too probably too commercial for. Yeah, time. exactly. So I was sort of, sh I felt shut out of some places. I had, and I w really want to stress this. I have absolutely no like sadness for all this failure, and no, I, I I'm so happy to, that it went down. This well, way. actually, it seems to have been key to your current success. If that hadn't happened, you would not be who you are right now, and you also wouldn't be being played on that station, you wouldn't be it's enjoying true. this kind but of But I just want to also make the point that if you happen to not get played on a radio station or, get a, or don't get a gig, like, it's not becoming to, to rant and rave about it. Like, it's, I see other bands, I've seen other bands maybe along the way who've been like, oh, they don't play my music or something. Like, just don't, don't do that. It's a, there's a lot of reasons for why you shouldn't do that, but... I, so I definitely don't have those feelings. Um, about no, 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 yeah. It's, I mean, it's interesting that the process that you went through after that, which I think you should talk about now, um, you know, you, you put that record out, didn't really work out, but you were like, okay, I'm still a musician, obviously, and I'm still a songwriter. And it took, I think, a lot more uh, personal strength than people here would realise, knowing now that you've had successful singles and have done... Uh, you know, festival touring and d you Keep On Running did well and all the singles following that did well and everything. People kind of know you as that guy now. But there was a good period of time where 
you were just the guy who recently had a record that didn't work, who was who everybody thought was going to put out a big hit record. So it was a really hard, probably quite a hard time. How did that factor into the way that you then went about writing and producing for Sea of Approval? Because songs like Keep On, I mean, I'm, I'm of the opinion, right, your biggest hit represents the, the most you thing you are at the time. So, like, if your biggest hit is about you being a psycho who always has some kind of, like, issue that stops them from achieving their thing, then that's, that's what the song's going to be about, do you know what I mean? And for Andy, I think Keep On Running is a very indicative of the story that went before he put that song out, which is the expectation that he would just have to keep working. I mean, it was almost a decade of work, like, or at least five to six years of hard work with no reward. So what were you writing about? How did you keep the faith during that period, you know? Well, what happened after the, that first record tank, I started getting a lot of support slots for other, um, playing for other people. Bands, some bands that don't exist anymore that were really kind of hot on the indie scene, a little jangly indie thing kind of happened. Hungry Kids of Hungary? Yeah, Little Red was another one. Tons of bands like this. And um, so I did a lot of national supports. Uh, and, you know, like, I don't know, like 100 shows in a year or more or something like that. And we started doing them solo. There was more than that. It was so many. Like, I did, I did so many shows over the course of about two years. I did them solo, so I had to get my solo chops together, which was super, super educational because you have to be able to, you know, perform and also wrangle your instruments and the audience and also kind of learn the ropes as a live. You know, you're a guy who, you're a support act, and that's a really... That can be really educational and sometimes really tough, kind of, uh, but very good kind of realm to cut your teeth in for a number of reasons. Um, no one knows who you are. No one ha has to care. The default is to be to completely ignore you or, in fact, if you happen to, like me, have bangs at the time and sound like a girl, um, get caught all kinds of stuff, you know. But it's good because you start to realise that all this stuff that is potentially um, your weaknesses or the flaws or all the re reasons why you're like totally out of fashion, you, those become your weapons. Like, look at the good, like, the good comedians and stuff. That moment where they get heckled, that's when the show starts, you know? Because you've got, you've got your, your story and um, you have to start realising that you've got a story and everyone in the audience has a story. And uh, that that comes you come face to face with that when it's you in a in doing a support show for a thousand people who didn't come see you, and then you added, added a guitarist who still plays with me now six years later, and then a drummer, and then we're doing trio gigs, and then we did those tours and tours and tours and tours, and then I did an EP, and then I toured more and more and more. Now that EP was quite different, really. You did a uh, single with Lisa Mitchell. It was much more of a folky kind of live uh, sounding EP. And, uh, and then there were another, another few songs in there that you did do some collaboration I, with. I collaborated with everyone who I'd supported. Lisa yeah. Mitchell, Hungry Kids of Hungry, Little Red, um, uh, Adrian Deutsch, who was in a band called Red Riders at the time. Um, the band who played on the record were the rhythm section from a band called Deep Sea Arcade, who were doing stuff at the time. So it went from being something that was like organised for me to then something that I kind of had I organically put together myself over time. So time is the essential ingredient here. And the song flame too. over time gets bigger. You, your circle gets bigger, you know? I think that, I mean, aside from that being a very clever way to slowly generate positive feeling around you getting played on Triple J by playing with every other band that was currently being played on Triple J, which is clever, um, the songs also changed a little. And this, given that this is a songwriting conversation, I just wanted to talk a bit about how, I mean, I felt like the, the songs on the first record were... Uh, grandiose, commercial, and external as a focus. Whereas the first, like, you know, small town girl, you're talking to the girl from the small town about how it's different living in the city and some of the things that they've assumed. Is that what it's about? I have no idea. It seemed so. to be about that to me. Um, but, you know, it's external. It's like, here's the observations I've had about life, here's some things that are going on with you, etc. Whereas Dog, which was the tune that you did with Lisa Mitchell, this was the first tune that indicated a change in your writing. Um, was kind of about depression and sort of about you to some degree, I can imagine. Why the shift? Did it just work better to be talking about that or have you started thinking about your own stuff a lot more? It's a really good question because that's when it really, like, that's when things really start. My, 
my view on songwriting kind of changed a lot during that time. Things started to happen. Um, I guess, you know, I, I had supported these guys. I, so I'm self-taught, and I thought I had to be as good as, like, the most well-trained, proper, official kind of musicians, all this sort of thing. And I've worked so hard to become really choppy and all this kind of stuff. And then I went and supported these guys who didn't even know what chords they were playing. But their shows were really good. And they had a connection. And, you know, um, the little red guys, particularly, because they were just like, how do you guys even exist? Like, how do you get them? It's like herding cats. How do you even get them in the tour van? They were like 19 or whatever. So. Yeah, they were so, like, just, like, having a good time. And... But they, the, the songs they wrote were really fun and people really engaged them. And then Lisa was the same. Like, she wasn't a virtuoso at all, but she, it was, like, moving in a way I hadn't kind of expected. Supporting her. I ended up playing her in her band. That's how I kind of... That was a big thing for me as well because uh, we were touring and the story goes she cut her hand on the first night of the tour and couldn't play guitar. So I stepped in and played piano for the rest of the tour. So it was, like, getting inside the songs and seeing really, like, how simple they were. And that was such an eye-opener to me, because I was like, everything's got to be snappy, you know, sus seven, suspended four, anticipated, you know, then the inversion, like, everything's got to be like Quincy Jones, you know what I mean? And uh, hers were like, all in C major, you know, six, eight time. Like, it was just like, wow, you don't need any of that other stuff. That was really educational. And then I think that kind of started to filter in, like, why don't why you just sim simplify things a little? And then suddenly, throughout the process of simplifying, some kind of more, like, maybe some more honest words sort of started to come out. But that was also scary, because I thought, no one's going to want to hear this. Like, um, no one really cares about lyrics. And no one's going to want to hear this shit that I have to say, because it's junk. And my story is kind of crap. And, like, you know what I mean? You don't, you don't think there's any legitimacy to your own sort of meanderings. But then you kind of find a couple of words that click and you go, oh, that's all right, I wonder what people think of this. And then that's suddenly um, songwriting, it, it goes from being a way to impress people, which is maybe what I was slightly guilty of viewing it as, to being something that could actually be as much as you can do with complete strangers, like share, sort of. But I don't, don't get... maybe therapeutic in some ways. Yeah, well. yeah, but don't get carried away with that stuff. Because as soon as you start going, it's, it's my therapy, it's my fucking voice... It's, I'm giving back to people. <laughs> it's really bad. Like that. That's also that's the incorrect way. Yeah. That might be a, that might happen, but it's certainly not a way to impress You're people. You're a tool if you say that. Though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But in it, and if that happens, it's almost by accident. But what I mean is that the feeling started to change. I was playing with musicians who were, I knew who I supported. I was writing songs that were kind of more like actually the stuff I thought rather than like. Here is the vision for the world, and here, look, check this out. Yeah. Well, I'd like to talk about that record now. Uh, following on from the EP, the record that largely everybody will know you from in this room. Uh, it was nominated last year for Best Pop Album at the Aries, which is very exciting. Um, and I can't imagine you could have imagined that would happen ten years after the record that you probably thought might get that nomination. Um, it was such a different album, Sea of Approval. You largely produced and wrote everything on that yourself, if not played all of it. You played everything but the drums, as far as I know. Um, and it took a long time for you to write. Uh, can we talk about a couple of key tracks? I think it'd be great to talk about Keep On Running because the theme of that song is perseverance um, and the song itself is quite different to anything you'd ever done before. How did you write that and why did you write that? Okay, so I'd been working, after all that EP and stuff, I'd kind of been working um, at like an office job, which actually wasn't bad, I was going to do some graphic stuff, and I've been doing that for a couple of years, and I thought maybe I would just give that some music another crack and just see, because I was turning like 27 or 28, and I was like, you know, maybe I'll just, I'll just see what happens, and um, I got the guys together from Deep Side Arcade, who I'd done the previous... Um, EP with like two years earlier, and we rehearsed one song, and I was going to see if I could kind of just produce it myself. I didn't really want to work with anyone else. I always found that pretty stressful, um, being on someone else's time. So I thought, I'll just try to like see if I can produce a band, and I don't really know if I can, but I'm going to give it a go. And I found an e engineer who um, ended up doing the whole record, so he's, you know, he plugs the things in and he mixed it and everything like that. 
And I was lucky because he was a really gentle guy. I just wanted someone gentle to work with, like just like give me my time to like figure this out. And um, we went and we rehearsed and we recorded this one song, which was Talk Too Much, right? Which I demoed up on my computer at home. It was really 80s. I had a drum machine. I was like, I want to do this with live drums. Got the engineer. I was like, can we like, try this sort of drum sound? And, and I arranged the parts and we recorded it. And, and that was all good. And then before we start, we stopped for the, the, the session for the day. Because I was just going to do one song, just to see, right? Um, minimum risk that way. I got the drummer to do a beat, like I sort of beatbox out of beat for him and he played it. Uh, well, I'll just keep that on file, maybe I can use that for something later on. And then I went and spent like weeks working on Talk Too Much, like trying to learn how to use compressors and EQs and sound cards. Like, I didn't really know this stuff very well. And um, it was very hard and I finally, after weeks of finessing, I got really sick because I was really stressed out about it. I was like, this is a terrible idea. I, can't, I don't think I can do this for a whole record. I'm really bad. Um, I, did, I did the song and it's like, Talk Too Much was finished. I was like, oh, thank Christ. Like, it's done. There's nothing more I can add. I can't move around because I was trying to make it as good as possible, but like not too dense. But what, what keyboard sounds? Because, you know, I'd done this other EP. What are people going to think of this one? How does it fit in? Like really intellectual kind of level stuff. Uh, which is just chasing your own tail. I finally finished this, I like, thank God. I wonder what that other drum file was. And I picked it up and I went, this is really good. I plugged in, the, in my Juno and I started playing. And then literally the whole song, after spending like six weeks on tour too much, the whole of the Keep On Running was written in about 30 minutes. I was like, well, I think this is kind of exciting, but um, I don't, it's kind of different. I don't know if anyone's going to want to hear this. Uh, the lyrics had all come out on the spot and everything like that. And what was it about? I mean, we're getting towards the end here and we've probably got another four minutes of chat and then maybe five minutes of conversation with the audience if you want to ask one or two questions. Um, but I'd like to talk about what that song's about and also how the palette changed. Because when you say you're worried people weren't going to accept it, maybe they're, you're worried about that because it sounds so completely different. It's a lot more spare. It's a lot more electronic. It sounds more like Gary Newman, the, you know, one of the artists that you were kind of referencing rather than Otis Redding. It's, Still soul, but there's this harder, more electronic 80s influence kind of sound in there and electronic sound in there. Um, is that something that you were thinking about or did it just happen because you were producing it? I think it, it actually really just happened. Um, those, the tools I had at the time, I had a bass guitar, a guitar, a Juno, and the drum track. Those are what I had in the room, so that's just what I used. And just did it really not without thinking about it too, too much. Didn't labour over it. Uh, and I think that's probably because I'd gotten really sick and was just like unable to think any longer. So that actually happened a couple of times on record. I get really stressed trying to work on this stuff, trying to make it happen, and I just like burn out because I've been doing shows and stuff. And then when I was just really groggy and sick, um, I just finished songs. So that happened with Baby on Nobody Now as well, one of the other singles. Same sort of thing. You gotta just, you know, do it without judging. You gotta, you gotta ride it, move quickly, get momentum, do it quickly. All the stuff that happened that ended up on the record was just the stuff that got finished. Would it be fair to say, <clears throat> in summing up this conversation, the movement from making a first album, which had all of this um, pre-meditation and you planned things and people had arranged all this stuff and it was kind of half you and half this bigger picture of people trying to machine a career for you, to the last record, which was you just kind of doing it without worrying too much about it, Strangely, the success came from it just being part of your day-to-day -day work and not something that you laboured over too much. I mean, you're working on it, but not something that you worried about day and night in terms of content, right? Well, I did worry about it a lot. That would be incorrect to say that I didn't. But then the, the bits that get finished and the bits where it actually goes well are the bits where it's, the worry isn't there, where you're just kind of working. So at, particularly in the middle of the process, there was, a, there was like a couple of months there where I just didn't finish anything because I was undoing it. I'd do it, I'd undo it, I'd speed up the tracks. I'd be like, what, how is this going to fit in? Like, uh, along that time, I met Craig Nichols from The Vines and he said, you know, thinking is the enemy. And it was true. Like, you, you really have to just... This is a medium where we're dealing with sort of physical aspects, like rhythm, emotional aspects waking sound, if you make it an intellectual process or an academic process, which is really tempting to do, especially when so much of what you're doing is like academic, like how does a compressor work? 
where do I plug this? How do I patch this stuff in? Um, if you make the creative side too intellectual, start second guessing things, start second guessing your own preferences, it makes things really, really, really slow. And eventually you just have to like get over that because you can't change, you can't change your preferences, you can't change things that, that you, the flame for you is going to be very unique to your soul's particular journey, yeah, right? And even if it's slightly embarrassing, you, in your opinion, it's still your thing. So. I was really embarrassed at first, but I keep on running because I was like, this is an R&B course. Like, people are going to think I'm trying to be an R&B guy. Lucky that's pretty cool right now to be an R&B yeah, guy. Yeah, right, but, but, and, but you don't... You, you can't really um, predict or you can't control what ends up being the magic, you know? Um... But definitely, you don't arrive at that intellectually. You arrive at it by following your own particular embarrassing preferences and learning to accept them and like work with them and manage them. You know. Let's uh, let's hear some embarrassing preferences from the audience as we finish up. Does anyone have any questions for Andy about songwriting or anything? Have a roving mic over there. Hey, I just wanted to ask quickly if you could elaborate uh, just on how you got the Joss Stone supporting tour. How long was it? Was it all, all around the US? And, and how was it working with someone of that calibre or, or supporting someone of that calibre? Um, okay, well, it was organised, I think, through probably the record label at the time. This was at a time where I didn't really have much interface. It was about five shows, or, or maybe, five, maybe five shows just around Australia. Um, and it was a complete waste of time, in one sense. Like, if you're talking about, like, is this strategically going to get me career forward in my career? No, it had nothing to do with that. Because all of these things, like support tours or whatever that happened like that, people go, oh, you get your name out. Like, you're, you're supporting so-and-so. It's like, if, if, if your particular thing isn't ready, like, you don't have the record ready or you don't have a good band, it's sort of, it's contextless. You know, it has no connection. There's no, there's no single thing that you can do, as in singular thing that you can do, um, that will launch you, whatever that means. It's really a slow, piece by piece thing. And some opportunities like that are gonna be like, like kind of just diversions or learning experiences, but they're not sort of central. Like it didn't, that didn't lead to anything or, or, or whatever, you know. Uh, anyone else? Just one last one to finish. Make it a good one, no pressure. Yeah. Come on, you. You were saying earlier that when you're writing lyrics, you just kind of strung words that sounded good together and they had some contextual meaning, but nothing too big. How did you improve upon your lyric writing? Like, how do you advance upon that? Well, you, you just, you keep doing that. You keep doing that. There's no, there's not time. Um, not like a shortcut through it. One of the things is the journey is long and arduous and it's kind of meant to be. Yeah. So you keep stringing words together. You just keep doing it. You keep doing what you can. And then eventually you listen and the, the sort of meaning of things, you start to articulate yourself a bit better. Never beat yourself up about where you are at currently or never like dramatically change tack because you feel like there's a smarter way to do it. It's just not, it's just not a smart way to do it. Just slowly is, is the smartest way. I think that's it for today. Please thank Andy Ball for some very good advice. Thanks for coming.